Namaste and welcome to tonight's Vicharamantan, where we'll be delving into the topic of pornography. My name is Vidhu Sharma and I'll be guiding you through this discussion today. For those of you who are new to the platform, Vicharamantan is an independent voluntary organisation which engages in open dialogue with members of society and institutions. We explore issues facing modern British society through a Hindu civilizational lens. Vichar literally means ideas and Manthan means churning. Here at Vichar Manthan, we shy away from no sensitive or controversial topic. With the growing societal interest during lockdown, we deemed it appropriate now to talk openly and objectively about pornography. Applying the Dharmic civilizational lens, we'll be asking, is there a problem with porn? Is it unethical? Is it misogynistic? Is it harmful psychologically? Or is it good for stress and depression? Is it fun for couples and beneficial for intimacy? What we do know, according to Ofcom, the Government Office for Communications, is that half of UK adults watched porn during the pandemic. Research shows Pornhub has a bigger audience than BBC News. And porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon and Twitter combined. Shockingly, the global porn industry is worth $97 billion. More and more it is becoming part of popular culture. Many of you will have seen that famous Black Mirror episode where they're having sex through VR. Isn't porn and virtual sex just what we can expect from the future? Here at Vicharamanthan, we want to push our arguments to the limit and really test them for objective truth. So we're going to hear from two expert witnesses, but by way of a brief agenda, today's month then will start with their opening remarks, followed by a 40 minute dialogue. Um, and then we'll move over to a 20 minute Q&A. So be sure to get your questions in, in the comments box below. Um, and if you're enjoying what you see and you'd like to hear more about how you can get involved with Vicharamant, then, then I'll be sharing some details in the end about how you can do that. But you can visit us at Vicharamant on all social media platforms and at vicharamanthan.org to find out about our upcoming events, book clubs, podcasts and much, much more. As I mentioned, we're going to hear from two expert witnesses, Gail and Bavid. Dr. Gail Dines is joining us from across the pond. She is the founder and president of Culture Reframed and a professor of sociology and women's studies at Wheelock College in Boston. Having researched and written about the porn industry for more than 30 years, Dr. Dines is internationally acclaimed as a leading expert on how pornography shapes our identities, cultures and sexuality. Bhavin Patik, MBE, is the founding trustee of the York Foundation and head of mergers and acquisitions at Canopius Group. He was recently awarded an MBE by Her Majesty the Queen for services to business and British Hinduism. So welcome both to today's month then. I'm going to first go over to Dr. Dines for her opening remarks. So Gail, is there a problem with porn? Well, if there isn't, I would say I've wasted the last 30 years of my life. OK, so let's be clear. Um, when you look at the empirical evidence, there are, I mean, the problems of porn mount up. So let's just give a very brief account. We know that the average age of first viewing porn, and when we say porn, I want to be very clear now, we're not talking about your father's playbook. Mainstream porn that is accessible within a, a click, uh, within, what, five seconds, which is mainly Pornhub, owned by MindGeek. So mainstream porn on Pornhub or X-Porn or whatever these sites are, the free sites, is violent, abusive, dehumanizing and misogynist at its core. In fact, if it wasn't misogynist, it wouldn't sell. That's what makes porn popular. There is no way that porn can ever be ethical because it is about the monetization and commodification of women's bodies. And on a cultural level, it eats away at who we are as human beings, as a culture, as the way in which women can exist as um, a sex class that's not oppressed. So what pornography does is really reproduces all of the elements of patriarchy and makes life, I would argue, virtually impossible for women and children and really doesn't help men or boys much at all. And I'm sure as we go into this, we'll talk about how the porn industry works, how it targets boys, 
young boys, and also the way it undermines the social, emotional, and cognitive well being of young people. So, there is nothing good I can say about the porn industry. In the 30 years that I've studied it, researched it, written about it, lectured about it, I cannot argue that there is one positive thing from pornography. Wow, a, a very definitive answer there and some interesting insights that I definitely want to unpack a bit later in the discussion. Um, but at first I'd like to go over to uh, Bhavanji for his uh, initial thoughts. So Bhavanji, is there a problem with porn? Um, namaste and Jane uh, uh Vidalji and uh, Dr. Dines, um, and to all our viewers and audience. Um, I think it's difficult to argue with what uh, Gail has just said. Uh, I think it is an issue, it is a problem. Um, and I think we need to deal with it and look at it in, from different perspectives in, in order to address what is, what, what is a, a difficult issue. But can I just begin by, by saying that coming here to talk about pornography as a subject was not an easy decision or choice, believe me. It's controversial, it's taboo. I mean, this is an uncomfortable topic. Um, some felt it would not be appropriate to participate in this because it might be embarrassing or unsuitable. So, and, and for some, it, it might be a joke, but I think it's important precisely for those reasons that we do begin to address this issue because the more we turn a blind eye to it and bury our hands, uh, bury our heads in in, 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 the, in the sand, the more of a problem it becomes, especially um, for our youth and our future generations. And I think that the, the hypothesis as a pornography as a problem is, is as, as you've sort of articulated, one is that the consumption of pornographic material particularly online websites, is rife. I mean, it's already always existed in some way, shape or form, but I think to the extent it now exists and how accessible it has become is where the problem is. And I think um, uh, Dr. Dines may, may, may touch upon this, and she did in, in, in her commentary, which is the nature of it as well is quite worrying. How it's moving from what she described as, you know, the old, playboy to to the kind of the forms of uh, pornography that is accessible and available today and how proliferated it is so the hypothesis is that, is that the consumption of pornography and the type of pornography is, is rife um i mean from my point of view when i was younger um, if someone wanted to get their hands on pornography they had to go to great lengths believe me top shelf of the shop for example um and even with the advent of internet, as the internet arrived, it was accessed through a PC. But today, it's available on a mobile phone very easily with very little control as to who can get to see it. That can't be a good thing. That is a problem. Um, and then the other hypothesis is also what uh, Dr. Dines touched upon, which is that it is further affecting younger minds. Um, their psychology their attitudes and expectations towards uh, relationships and the opposite sex. And quite poss possibly the consumption of uh, pornography has proliferated to the extent that it's somewhat normalized, especially among the younger generations, that the shock effect is becoming less and less and less because it's becoming more normalized. So um, what I would want to sort of um, go into and, and later on in this part of this discussion is, is, is what is the dharmic perspective on this? Because, um, of course, um, our sages and scriptures don't specifically talk about pornography, but I think there, there is a, a, a enough of a guidance and, and uh, um, insight there that we, we can apply to this, con um, to this uh, context. But yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring this further. Thank you, Bhavanji. Yes, those, those, that guidance and that, that insight from, from the sages is definitely something that I'll be questioning you about a bit later. Gail, you made it quite clear that there is not a single thing, a good thing that you can say about the porn industry. But what about the studies that suggest it is, can be good for mental health, for relaxation, it can help couples explore their kinks? And, and how about this, this one benefit that... Um, 
I find quite undeniable. It gives the LGBTQ plus community uh, representation and visibility in a way that does not ha happen in mainstream culture. Is your problem, for my question, is your problem with the production or the consumption of pornography? Uh, my problem is with from production to consumption and all along the value chain. So I think of pornography as an industry and a value chain. We know at the point of production, it is the exploitation and monetization and abuse of women's bodies and often also children, many underage women or girls, also a lot of trafficking victims are used. And let me be clear, it's not women with PhDs and law degrees and medical degrees lining up to be in porn. It's women who, if they're lucky, are looking at minimum wage jobs, often pimped out by their boyfriends or just regular pimps. So first of all, at the production end, you are talking about an entire industry based on the exploitation of women. You move along the value chain to payment systems, et cetera, and let's get to the uh, distribution end. And at that point, we know that, Ma that MindGeek, which is the biggest single distributor and owner of porn sites in the world, it's the equivalent to the Amazon of pornography, is actually a criminal enterprise. And there are now hearings and investigations into the work of MindGeek in Canada going on through the Canadian government. So all along the value chain, it is corrupt to the core. And it is, again, I want to keep reiterating this is based on the exploitation of women and children's bodies. Now, let's talk about kink. What is kink? Let's deconstruct. We, we, this thing falls from our mouth. You're talking about sadism. OK, we like to use this alphabet soup as BDSM. It's not B and it's not D and it's not M. It's S. It's sadism. This is sexual sadism. When you look at sites like kink.com, what you're seeing is mainly men being sadistic to women. So it's very much around um, the oppression of women on that. And as for the LGBT community, you really want to leave it up to a bunch of predatory businessmen to decide the sexual template and lives of the LGBTQ community. You mean we can't do better than that? We can't have good sex education in schools for the LGBTQ community? We can't become more understanding and a more egalitarian society? Instead, we leave it up to a bunch of predatory pimps who control the porn industry to provide the sex ed that as a society we should be providing for that community. So on no level, does pornography for me provide any service? And if anything, the most exploited in by pornographers is the LGBT community and especially the kids because often they're kicked out of homes when they come out as gay or transgender. They're on the streets and within 72 hours they're being pimped out. So the pornography industry does not help them. If anything, it feeds off them. And so are you suggesting that porn doesn't help create any sense of a, a pro-sex culture and 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 so my follow-up question is like how how can we deny the effect of a pro-sex culture on liberating no, we the want woman pro -sex. yes we want, i'm pro-sex 100 percent. that's why i'm anti-porn you can't be pro-sex and pro-porn you have to make a decision okay you're either pro-sex or you're anti-porn because the most anti-sex images you'll ever see in the world are, are in pornography. Pornographers don't like sex. What gets them aroused is money. So what's really interesting is how this well-oiled um, porn industry and its PR of the porn industry has hijacked the term pro-sex. Those of us who fight the porn industry are pro-sex. Mm. I would argue if you support it, you're sex negative. And think about what, what porn yeah. says about women. It says the role of women is basically to be used and abused by any man. And think what it says about men. The porn industry says men are nothing more than um, basically erect penises. They've got no, no capacity for morality, for empathy, for love. They're just life support systems for erect penises. You think they like men much more than they like women? No, they like men's money and they want to exploit them. But on every level, porn is based on the exploitation of what it at its core means to be human. Uh, they were researching for this uh, month and I, I watched a lot of what uh, pornographers and porn stars have to say. And, and there are many women that would say that they use porn as a form of expression. How does your feminism differ from their feminism? Um, do you mean the women in porn? Yeah, or? yeah. So well, there are all, some examples. The, the women in porn are in a terrible... Let's not use the word porn stars. There's only a handful. Let's talk about porn performers. You cannot ask a woman 
who is in pornography, who every day has to get up and do a porn scene with men orally, anally, vaginally, pounding away at her and ejaculating all over it. You cannot ask her to figure out what is happening to her on a daily basis. There will be a complete psychological meltdown. And I've spoken to many women who have exited the industry and they talk about the psychological breakdowns that go on all the time during the scenes. Flashbacks from PTSD, many of them were abused as children. So what these women have to say, I did not become a feminist to fight these women. I became a feminist so we could say that women in pornography should have alternative ways ways of earning a living in a fair and just economy that's my argument so i'm not my fight is not with them my fight is with the men who control the industry we always like to turn it into a cat fight as if it's woman against woman no these are my sisters and my job is to liberate my sisters the enemy here are the men who control the porn industry and it is vastly controlled by men Thank you, Gail. There's so much there that, that we'll be getting into, but I just want to go over to Bavinji. I want to ask, as a man yourself, like what emotional hole do you think porn is filling for men? Um, and, and what do you think, and how do you think we can fill that hole through, through other means? Uh, what does that affect psychologically? Yeah. And how can it be filled elsewhere? I, well, I, I think two things come to mind as you, as you pose that question. First of all, I'm not convinced it's filling a hole. I think in some respects it's creating that hole to begin with. Um, and in another way, there is this sort of, uh, if there is a hole, it's to do with a lack of education and awareness. Um, and so particularly in some cultures, it goes back to my earlier point as to, you know, the whole controversy of me even appearing um, on this discussion or for, for this topic is it, it is a taboo, it's inappropriate, and it's not openly talked about, it's not addressed in many cultures, even Western society is not properly addressed, sex education and, and you know, is not necessarily addressing pornography as well. It, it's very limited in, in its form and, and in its delivery. And so what uh, pornography does in some ways, and I don't think this is the intention of it, is fill that gap of education and awareness and of what sex is, sexuality, and, and, and what those uh, intimacy might, might, might be about, what intimacy might be about. So, I mean, that's really stretching it, though. That may be one hole that it's filling there. But I'd argue um, that pornography is probably creating a hole that it is then filling itself. It, it's creating the demand, going back to um girl's point that it is a business and business depends on demand and so it's creating that demand of certain types of uh activities some forms of pornography etc creating that um you know some of the, the sort of abbreviations that uh, gail referred to so it's about creating that and so it it becomes a, 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 a topic in itself in the playground, among peer groups, down the pub, et cetera, where these things are then talked about, shared um, uh, among peers, and then that hole is created. So I'm not, very, I'm not sure that it's necessarily filling the hole other than maybe where there's been an absence of proper education. Um, but I, I'm of the opinion that in, in some respects, it's actually creating that hole um, mm -hmm. yeah, for men. I'm, I'm not sure if you know, uh, Bavinji, but female ejaculation is actually banned on film. Um, and that seems quite sexist. Um, so like, my question to you is, uh, do you think the global porn style has been influenced by Western views of sex, i.e. masculine power? Um, and how does it differ from Hindu depictions of sex? Um, well, in, in answer to your point, I did not know that. Um... But, um, so it's, it's an interesting fact. I think absolutely it is a uh, a, a male. It, it's been created for 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 men uh, in some ways, and um, that that demand uh, is is been created for men, and the customers are men, and and therefore it is a a very male dominated in some ways. Some would argue misogynistic industry. Um, so I, I mean that's probably how it exists but but in terms of the hindu view of things i mean look hindu culture i want to say and, and not necessarily hinduism as a religion but say hindu vedic culture or the dharmic culture is pro-sex let's, let's not make a mistake about that but 
it was also very it is also very mature i think it's been misunderstood that um you know the hindu culture is very conservative and where sex is taboo and etc etc cetera, et cetera. whereas in actual fact if you go back um a few thousand years it was actually much more accepting of it uh of sex and sexuality it was you know this is part of life this is what makes you and me this is what you know um is is natural and it exists let's not deny or reject it but in some ways celebrate it as as, as part of life um and so that's why we have texts that that go into this subject in, in, in a lot more detail um but the key thing i, I would want to say is I'm oh, just going back to that point, sorry, is then that culture was then influenced by uh, invaders and the cultures they brought um, to, to the region and their religious point of views as well. But that was then that then, uh, I suppose, influenced how um, Indian culture, Hindu culture then came to view um, sex and sexuality. If you um, go back years, sorry, Bhavanji, you, you would on. see that there are naked bodies all over ancient Hindu temples. Would you not classify that as uh, an expression of, of of porn? Is that is that not erotic porn in I, its own right in terms of art? Um, <laughs> there's a, there's a number of points you make there. I mean, first of all, I, I've heard that and seen seen that in many times actually. So, so let's take Khajuraho Mandir for example. So these sculptures were created in the temple during the 10th century. Um, and this temple is in Madhya Pradesh in India. It's open to the public and it's recognized by the government. 10% of the sculptures are erotic. So it's not as if the whole place is all about this temple and worship of, of sex and, and, and erotica. It isn't. 10% of it is, which philosophically depicts that, look, a, a part of human life is human sexuality as well. And there are other mandirs as well. There's the, the Konark uh, temple as well, that the British famously described as the most beautiful as well as the most obscene. So, you know, here's a conservative culture um, uh, taking a view on, on, on the Hindu culture. Sun Temple in Madeira similarly has sculptures as well. So it's not pornography. What it is doing is saying this is part of life. You know, there's Dharma, there is Artha, there's Karma. Moksha, one aspect of life is Karma, i.e. fulfillment of desire, which is all good and well when it is done within these regulatory principles, i.e. when it is done within Dharma, um, when it is within moderation and with discipline. And so that's what these sculptures, these texts are depicting and showing that pretty much look sexuality is part of everyday life um and i think the thing i would add there in some ways the the more sexuality is rejected and denied the more private it becomes and the more private it becomes the more perversion that inevitably arises um and that's where maybe you know pornography has, has a bigger role to play um but I, I reject the notion that that is pornography or or or, or erotica it isn't um but what a strange place to put erotic images if that was the intention you know on the side or the top of a temple um it, it just doesn't make sense um but it, it's more of an issue today because we look back at this and and the culture has changed quite drastically to much more conservative and uh, treating sex, sexuality, erotica as, as, as a taboo. Gail, I want to bring you in here um, because Bhavan, you made quite a statement there. The more private it becomes, the more problematic it becomes uh, in reference to not talking about sex. So what is your view on that? I think it's exactly true. I think the more, you see, the problem is, I think the view is whether it's private or public in a patriarchal system, the view is that sex is dirty and the dirt in it is women. I think that's part of many religious teachings and I think it's part of like, definitely pornography. That's the message in pornography. Um, I think the fact that we do not teach good sex education or progressive sex education, um, the fact that we do not teach sex education that helps um, kids unpack what they're seeing in pornography all of these things, like we don't even have conversations about pornography. I mean, um, I started a nonprofit called Culture Reframed 
and that's culture and free framed ed on the end and we started that nonprofit because what we wanted to do was to help parents build resilience and resistance in their kids to porn because we say if parents don't talk to their kids about porn then the porn industry will so it's better you get there first so we built two programs one for parents of tweens one for parents of teens. Each one took a year and a half, built by eight to 10 experts in the field, which include MDs and PhDs in clinical psychology, developmental psychology, neuroscientists. We brought together the very top draw consultants. The program looks seamless um, there, but it's actually built by many people. And we also offer it for free. And we did that because we were a nonprofit that believed that everybody, irrespective of socioeconomic um, position, should have access to this. So it is the only, they, they are the only programs I know of in the world that have been set up that science based, but engaging and accessible and interesting. So I do suggest for those of you, people out there who are interested in how to talk to kids about pornography, you look at our programs. We absolutely have to have conversations. You know, you know the problem is because we do not have a vocabulary about sex that is not pornographic. It's very hard to really talk about what does healthy sexuality look like? What does it mean? And really sex is not just reducible to organs and orgasms. Sex is a very important part of how one lives one's life. It teaches you how to be vulnerable. It teaches you how to make connections. It teaches you how to be empathic. Um, it teaches you what your bodily boundaries should be. And sometimes it makes you go a little beyond your comfort zone if you trust the person. These are all extremely healthy things to be taught. And yet now we have the, these, you know, or anything I can call them, these, uh, you know, predators in the porn industry have hijacked all of what is wonderful and great about sex. And instead, brought this in and turned it into dirt, which is again, which is mainly what women have seen as important. So this is what really kills me about pornography when people say, you know, it's, it's ethical, it helps people learn and all of that. No, it doesn't. It's the very opposite. When you think of what a sustainable society is built on, it is built on love, compassion, empathy, respect and dignity. Everything that the porn industry rips away from women and from men as well. So, I mean, we need to think about sustainable societies and we need to understand the role that sex plays in sustainable societies. Uh, Gail, I'd just, like to pick a little, sorry, Bavinji. Yeah, I was um, just gonna come on though, as, as, as Gail mentioned, sustainable society, because that's something I very much feel, for, feel quite strongly about, because that's pretty much the, def for me, the definition of dharma, a sustainable society, right? So, you know, pretty much dharma supports and encourages anything that is consistent with that and rejects anything that doesn't as a dharma, that i.e. that which sustains a, a positive society. So, um, you know, when, when, when I just look at this from, from a dharmic point of view, then, you know, and, and, and addressing pornography in that way, it, dharma would say, as long as it's not a problem, it's not harming anyone, it's okay. However, the moment that whatever it is, and we could be talking about anything, but in this context, uh, pornography, the moment it starts being detrimental to the individual or the society, then uh, dharma rejects it. Um, and I think that's what we're discovering uh, as part of this uh, conversation. And what I'm learning certainly from, from uh, Dr. Dines is, is a lot of um, what comes out of pornography is, is certainly harmful, but not just to the individual, but also to society. And I'd like to add, um, I'm Jewish, and we have a concept in Judaism called Tikkun HaOlam, which means repair the world. And that's about very similar, is if you see a problem, your job is to help repair it and make the world a better place. So when you think about that and you think about what pornography does to our individuals, to our culture, to our world, to, every, to our young people, um, I think those of us who care about sustainable societies feel absolutely like we have to act. We cannot sit back and let this, you know, I, I feel personally that there has been a massive dereliction of duty on the part of adults that we have let kids have access to mainstream hardcore porn. I do, I think how we have allowed the pornography industry to march in and hijack our kids' sexuality, where have we been? I mean, I lecture to, you know, the American um, Academy of Pediatrics to, I just gave a lecture to the National 
the annual um, conference on the National um, Family Court judges. Where are all these professionals who are targeted, whose job it is to be on the front lines of protecting children? When I go to these conferences, you know what? I wish people would sit there and just nod their head and say, we know this, why are you telling us? But it's always news. And I think this should not be news. You should know this. This is your job to know this. So my frustration is that not only have we buried our head in the sand, but those professionals whose job, whose job description is to be there for children and to be children, child safeguarding, child caring, have basically dropped the ball as well. We, have a, we as a mass culture have dropped the ball on this and there's no excuse. Now we know what's happening. Now we have... 30 odd years of empirical research coming out of multiple disciplines. There is no excuse for adults to drop the ball on this. I, I'm very heartened to see that two civilizational lenses are coming together in the name of sustainability to talk about this topic. But Gail, I, I would like to ask, hasn't there been progress? Um, in the last five years alone, the UK government has banned the production and consumption of certain kinds of porn, limiting and restricting what we can see online. Isn't this quite a, a heartening um, sort of uh, move forward? Um, I'm, I'm sure there are um, very many similar initiatives taking place all around the world. Isn't there action being made? You, you referenced that um, culture reframed as is the first of, to, to run programs in, in this manner, but but our government's not acting? No, no. And in fact, the British government, it's outrageous what they did. They developed the age verification bill, which was a great piece of legislation, which would have made sure, that it would have been very difficult if you were under 18 to get on porn sites. And literally, as it was about to become law, they pulled the plug, which is a disgrace. And I haven't seen any outrage on the part of the British government. They were going to be, the, the UK was going to be leaders in the field of how to age verify from a third party so that kids wouldn't have access to porn. And they just basically, it's disappeared. And I know people in the field are outraged, but I haven't seen any public outrage about this. You know, as it was, as, I have not seen governments, any government act with a real backbone. I'll be perfectly honest. What I have seen, though, in the last five years, because I've been doing this for 30 years, so I have that lens, is I've seen a big increase in awareness that before, you know, journalists and people I would speak to always would have this cynical view. Not anymore. They're much more concerned. And in a way, this is because the pornography industry has sowed the seeds of its own destruction. It's become so violent that you can't look away anymore. But um, so things are getting better in terms of awareness. They are not getting better in terms of government. I would like to see one government be the first with the backbone to stand up to the porn industry and make a courageous decision on behalf of children and women to say that we are not going to allow this level of violence, sexual violence to permeate our culture. This has not happened yet. No. So I'm sadly, you know, you would hope it had. And um just dealing with lawmakers is impossible. And you know what? You know, law, you can't expect the lawmakers to make the laws. The people do. And if we were to pressure them enough and to say enough is enough, because to be honest with you, you know, most politicians and especially are, go, are controlled by business. Let's be honest. And the porn industry is has multiple billions of dollars to, and they use that for legal purposes. They use it for cultural purposes. They're very good at controlling the discourse, buying politicians killing off um, any legislation. So people have to rise up against them. It's always the people. But Gail, wouldn't, wouldn't a blanket banning just create a black market? Can't ban, can't industry? ban. Banning doesn't make any sense, given it's the internet. That's not how you would do it. What you need to do is regulate. You okay. need to regulate it out of existence. You need to regulate it, tie it down every which way, right across the value chain from production through to distribution and consumption. And by then make it so difficult to produce and distribute that it's really just becomes not worth it economically. They're only in it for the money. I believe me, these are not people trying to enlighten us around sexism and gender equality and have great sex. No, they're in it for the money. And if we were to make it difficult for them, for example, let's look at the cigarette industry. I am not allowed to go to a school, elementary or high school or whatever, and hand out free cigarettes. 
So why is the porn industry allowed to go into the bedrooms of these kids and hand out free pornography? I'm not allowed to go around and knock on people's doors and say, excuse me, do you have a kid living here? If you do, can you give them this bottle of beer? And by the way, I'll be back tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. No, the alcohol industry is not. We need to bring them into line with other predatory industries. It's not rocket science, this. Could you imagine if we deregulated the alcohol industry or any industry to the level that the porn industry is deregulated? So banning is a 20th century concept pre-internet. That's not the way we approach it this way. We approach it through legislation, regulation. Also, another very, very powerful thing is class action suits. So many women and children and men have been hurt in the production and consumption of pornography. We sue the pornographers. Now, you live in the, most of you probably there are from the UK. I'm in the US, right? The US is probably the most litigious society in the world. So let's sue them. I have been expert witness on a number of cases where we have actually bankrupted the porn companies. That's another way to go. Class action suits, bankrupt the hell out of them. That's what I would suggest. So no, we're not going to be able to ban it. That's not a realistic concept. Are we going to be able to address this through regulation and class action suits? Absolutely. If we have a political will and if the people decide that this is the way we want to go. We've spoken a lot about how the internet has changed uh, porn and its viewership, its production, its consumption. But I'd like to ask how, what your opinions are on OnlyFans and how that's changed the landscape. Um, or is it a symptom of the landscape getting worse? Because in for those that don't know at home, OnlyFan, in OnlyFans, uh, the content creator gets the money. There's no trafficking involved. Often it's just a solo display. Um, you know, the, the yeah, producer sorry. creates it themselves. And, and in an influencer culture where people would be giving that content away for free, um, how, how does that sort of, how does that, you know, there's no violence no. involved in that. What, what is your opinion? Well, on you don't know that. Fans? First of all, you've made a series of assumptions of which you don't know, okay? Because there's not been any studies on OnlyFans, so we don't know if the women are being pimped in or not. But I will tell you what's going on with OnlyFans. So first of all, it's a product of a mature business, the porn industry, finding new tentacles to make money. All businesses do that. OnlyFans is a brilliant idea. So in 2019, you had 120,000 so-called content producers. That's usually many young women working for OnlyFans. Last year, it was over a million because of COVID. Why? Because women were desperate to make a living. I heard the statistic, and I need to verify this, but I was on a, a webinar with somebody who'd done some research, and she said the average woman makes $138 a month from OnlyFans. Now, let's talk about this. Let's talk about what we know about OnlyFans. They're young women who often need the money, okay? They're not doing this for fun. They need the money, let's be perfectly honest. We know that the content they produce, you know, often is sexually explicit pornography. We know that content is being stolen because um, men are taking images from other devices and they're not loading them onto Pornhub and things like that. So these women have lost control of their image forever. Their image will live on after they die. That's number one. Number two is OnlyFans takes 20% of the women's earnings. That means OnlyFans, the platform, is a pimp platform to make money off women who are doing this, prostituting themselves one step removed, is actually to be a pimp. So OnlyFans is a pimp website. Even cleverer, it is actually a um, pimp pyramid scheme because what OnlyFans says to women, because they know they're not earning much, is that if you bring in your friends, we will give you a percentage of what they make. So OnlyFans pimps women out and turns them into pimps to get more women. So if is this the kind of society you want to live in? Do you want to live in a world where the way that women make money is by doing whatever some creepy guy at the other end of the computer or phone tells you to do, to stick two dildos in your anus or in your vagina? This is the way you think you should be making money. So, and we know that women are being doxxed through this. We know that there's threats, there's all other sorts of things as well. So, and capping, which is making money off their um, own production. So no, there's nothing about OnlyFans that is positive. And that what's happened is again, we live in a culture which has groomed and socialized young women into thinking that the only way you can feel empowered is through taking your clothes off and being looked at and being hypersexual. This is what it means to live in a porn culture. The porn culture grooms young women into thinking that they are either they've got to be visible, which means looking hypersexualized, or invisible. 
visibility. So, so how do we unlearn this behavior? How do we unlearn these, these values as a society? Feminism. Feminism. You have to start reading that. And, and when I say feminism, I don't mean the sort of what we call faux feminism, which is talking about empowerment all the time. I mean feminism, which really addresses what is called radical feminism that addresses the root problem of what is going on here. And once you start to read, and I, you know, I'm happy people should go on to the Culture Reframed website. They should also go on to my own website, gaildines.com. There's tons of resources up there. There's lots of TED Talks as well. I've got a TED Talk out there they should hear to. There's to you've got to start unlearning you know this country is brainwashing our young women into thinking that unless you're hypersexualized you don't matter and what we know from the american psychological association the most downloaded report they've ever done is that the more women self-sexualize the more girls and women self-sexualize the more they internalize the image of the of the culture the more depressed the more anxious the more likely they are to have risky sexual behavior the more likely they are to be raped all of these things it has terrible effects on young women. And really, we want a society where women can be visible because they're smart, they're interesting, they're creative, they've got all these wonderful human traits. We don't want them to be visible because they've got large breasts and wear um, high heels and looks like they've just stepped out of a porn magazine. That's not what we want women to be visible for. Now, you mentioned that it has detrimental effects on women, and of course, uh, uh, we would agree with that. But you've also referenced in, um, earlier on that it undermines the social, emotional, cognitive well-being of boys and men as well. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so we again have many. We have actually more research that on what porn does to boys than we do on what it does to girls. What we know is that the earlier a boy gets to porn, and we're talking now regular mainstream hardcore porn, the earlier we get to that, <clears throat> the more anxiety, the more depression, the more sexist attitude he has, the more likely he is to act out sexually, sexually aggress against um, a girl or a boy, but usually a girl, the more likely he is to have social isolation, more likely he is to have erectile dysfunction, more likely he is to become a porn addict. And porn addiction is real. We have neuroscience research that shows what happens to the neurons when they fire and wire around the porn images. So it has devastating effects on boys and I can tell you as the mother of a son you know really feminists are men's best friends we're the only ones who absolutely say that this is not good for men that, that, what, that what porn is saying about men we refuse to accept what porn says about men is they are you know absolutely the dregs of society all that they care about is their penises nothing else do, is this how men want to think of themselves? Do they think pornographers are their friends? When we, the feminists, say, you know what? We're going to let, we, we don't believe in this. We actually believe in the humanity of men. We believe in the capacity of men to love and have empathy just like women are. We are the only group as feminists rooting for men. It's the porn. Oh, you want to talk about man-hating? Go to the pornographers. Watch where you see the most negative images of men. Marvin, do you want to, I want to bring you in here um, about the, the sort of undermining of the cognitive, emotional well-being of men. Would you agree with, with what Gail's saying um, in terms of who it is that is rooting for the men? Um, in some respects, yes. And, uh, and just, just bringing it back to, you know, when we talk about young men and, and adolescents as they're growing up, let's face it, that's when their exposure to pornographic material peaks. Um, is when, when they're adolescents and, and uh, that, that's when they get to see the, see see this material. But fr from a, a from a dharmic point of view, and looking at ashram dharma, there's a focus on 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 the age, and that is particularly the age. And if you look at the the codified uh, smritis, which talks about brahmacharya, because it knows that uh, dharma knows that as uh, as a young man goes through. Um, adolescence grows into a young man. Um, he needs to learn the skills to become one with Brahman, I, uh, Brahmacharya, and that the heart of it is controlling sexuality. It oh, isn't yeah, I'm conscious it. that there are a lot of viewers that wouldn't have any idea uh, or, or ha understand the context behind that. So, could you just take it a few steps back and explain a little bit about what these ashrams are? Sure. So, so this goes this. this this goes back to ancient times where society is organized in a way where um, there are phases of life. 
and what the sages and the, the ancient thinkers um, codified in the Smritis, be it Yagna, Valkya, Smriti, Manusmriti, whatever else, is that phases are roughly split into the first sort of 20, 25 years, which is um, the Brahmacharya Ashram, and I'll explain that. Then comes around after 20 to, to about uh, 50 years, which is the, the ashram of the household or the grihastha and the responsibilities and the nature of how they need to live their life is different then. Then after that comes uh, uh, Vanaprastha is when there's a retired life, which is different to being a householder and, and a brahmacharya or, or, or Vanaprastha. And then there's a, there's a, um, a, a, a sannyasa, which is uh, a different uh, order altogether, which is saying, I'm going to focus full time on, on um, spiritual enlightenment. So if I go back to the Brahmacharya Ashram, which is the first phase of life, it is what are the priorities for a young person? It is to learn, is to develop skills, is to discover their capabilities. Um, and the distraction to all of that can be sexual indulgence, one of the distractions to that. And that's why at the heart of the Brahmacharya Ashram or that age, is um, learning how to control and regulate um, sexuality. Um, and so a lot of what you will see in when they go into the ashrams or schools is about how learning yoga, you're learning dhyan, ways of um, preserving. And here's an important thing, because there is, there is a link here to what um, Dr. Dines' research um, that she sp spoke about, is that the preservation of fundamentally virya, which is semen, and the transmutation of it, I, it, 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 there's a way of sublimating or transmuting the, the, the semen so the virya becomes orjas shakti. And the orjas shakti is where the, the inner power of, of this young man, be it mentally, spiritually, physically, becomes even stronger. And we, this is no secret, we, we, we know about this in, in, in uh, athletics, in, in sports, in boxing, et cetera, this, that the preservation of semen has, has, its, has uh, certain um, benefits. So this is taught through yoga, through um, the yogasanas, as well as the other, uh, other parts of, of, of yoga as well. Um, and Brahmacharya Ashram, there was a focus on that because it wasn't, and once again, I want to uh, emphasize it, it wasn't about rejecting or denying sexuality. It is about regulating it, moderating, learning to handle it and deal with it. Problem is, as soon as you put a, a mobile phone in front of someone of that age with raging hormones and everything else, it makes that task next to impossible. Um, and it completely destroys um the the whole of of what Brahmacharya ashram is meant meant to be and that's why though in those formative years it's very important that um you know that, that as, as gail touched on I, yeah i i take issue is it about government i mean government may or may not do something i think it's much more about society as a whole particularly parents and i know that's going to be uncomfortable and difficult because this has happened like that in the last few years it's just gone Oof, you know, mobile phones become more capable. You can watch videos on mobile phones. That wasn't always possible a few years of a hack. You know, you, you, it, so the proliferation of it, the accessibility of it, the nature of it has changed rapidly so fast with, the, uh, with technology that I don't think parents are that confident, let alone able, to address this issue. Um, Can I ask a question? Sure. Can I ask a question? So... You're talking about parents and, you know, I agree because we built parents programs that culture reframe. But would you ask parents to control the pollution that their kids breathe in? You need government to be involved. You cannot. The, you know, parenting is the most humble thing you'll ever do. And it is the most difficult. And to layer this on, that parents should now become experts in how to talk to their kids about pornography. And porn is everywhere. It's like saying to a parent, if you let your kid breathe polluted air, then I'm sorry, you've made a mistake as a parent. You know, even if you do everything you can as a parent at home, that doesn't mean the kid next door's parents have done the same thing, or they're not going to get together with other friends who's haven't got, whose parents have not put filters on. So I, I do think that we cannot ask parents to do this alone. It is an impossible thing. Why we, do we have a government? You know, the idea, if you go back to the sort of 
progressive ideas of the role of government. It's so we as individuals do not have to stand alone against massive corporations. It is that we, we cannot stand against massive corporations. They've got the money, the power and everything else. It is the government's job to, be, to, to which is a joke given what really goes on, but it is in that when you think about what um, political thinking is, it was the government's job, progressive political, to protect its individuals from the harms of big corporations because we can't do that alone. And so I think it's the same with pornography. I agree with a lot of what you say, and certainly parents should do this, but I'm sure as, you know, you're a parent, I'm a parent, you could, you, how, how can we ask them to take this on as well and become experts in how to keep kids away from drugs and alcohol and everything else? It's just too much. And also to make enough money to put food on the table and everything else. We need help with this. Parents need help. And I speak to so many parents who are desperate. I mean, they are desperate. Because first of all, they don't even know how to talk to the kid about porn. They have no idea. So, so, so before we get into to where the responsibility lies, I'd just like so to take I, a couple so of we're steps. Not doing that. We're saying it's a, we're not. It's of course, we're yeah. It. So it, it, it would be a, 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 pub, a public health approach, as I've, I've heard you say in earlier videos, where there is uh, involvement of the government, parents, sc the school institution, um, and I would like to ask you some questions on that um, just before we go over to Q&A. But I would also like to ask you, Gil, if you have any opinion on what uh, Bhavanji is saying about semen retention at a young age. Has your research taken you into that psychological, uh, not psychology, but that scientific, the human biology, uh, the spiritual reasons behind potentially not engaging in sexual activities for those formative years? Um, because I wonder, even if we were to regulate pornography now, would it would it stop young kids from uh, masturbating every day? Uh, would, would you have an issue with with that if they were well, finding other means? Goal. It is not my goal. That's not what I do. <laughs> and I would need to look at the research about that. What I'm interested in actually was what does the scripture say about girls masturbating? I. I'm interested to know that because it sounds very much like it's male centered here. And I'm interested, is there a similar set of um, teaching scriptures or whatever about what happens to girls going through that period when they must, and if they do, and if they masturbate, what are the effects on them? I, th I think it's pretty much the same, same, uh, obviously male and female physiology is completely different. However, the, the concept of orgias is remains uh, relevant in both contexts. So it, it isn't that Brahmacharya uh, Ashram is, is for boys only, not at all. It is, um, and loosely it's seen as the sort of the time for celibacy, if you like. Um, that applies to uh, to both both females, uh, so 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 girls as well. But the, uh, and I want to emphasize, it's not about say, denying sexuality at all. It's about regulating, learning, and, and it isn't just about sexuality. It's about your diet, your food, who you mix with, how you how you become a person, essentially, mm -hmm. how you define your identity, and that's and, and one of the issues here is where we're confusing sex and sexuality and pornography. Um, and where it's such a distant thing that we, we forget that it's also part of the being of, of a person. And in those formative years, what, um, what uh, uh, the dharmic perspective puts forward is, is important to sort of embrace all of that. And within the context of um, discipline, regulation, control, moderation, etc., so that it doesn't become a problem, so that you can... Um, that you can have sanyam or which, which is your personal control as well. Um, and so there's a lot of it is in terms of your personal responsibility. Um, but, but to your point, um, uh, Gail, that I don't think it necessarily distinguishes what um, is relevant uh, for, for a girl versus, versus a boy. I think I really like the idea of what you're talking about is how, well, you really, what I hear, and this is from, you know, my sort of position, um, is that what we talk about is how you bring, how you help a young person develop their own moral compass. And, with, and, and of course, parents must be guides, as is the extended family and everything. But ultimately, what you're teaching is inner discipline and control, not just of sex, but as you said, food and everything else. Because 
you know, when you, and especially say in the West, when you live in, for many of those who are not, for those who are not poverty stricken, when you live a life of abundance to the point of grotesque abundance on every level, how do you develop any sense of an inner need that is not outside defined. I, I remember one stream where I took my son, we were going to a birth, buy a birthday present for his friends. There was about six or seven. And I said, you know, we're in the shop now. Do you need any art supplies or do you want anything? And he said, mom, he said, there's a big difference between what I want and what I need. And no, I don't need anything at the moment. And so, you know, this was, I always felt my job was not to breathe down his neck all the time, but was to help lay the groundwork for him to develop this inner compass. And I think what you're talking about is a more cultural agreement that this is how we do it for our kids. And I think what you're right, once we put porn there, and remember, I could, we can compare it to fast food. You know, porn is to sex what McDonald's is to food. It's the, you know, it's the industrialization of a real human need. And then what it does is it, it robs you of that need, repackages it, and then sells it back to you at a high price that looks nothing like the original need. So the question is how in this world of abundance for the middle class and upper middle class, or anyway, do we get a sense of an inner being? Do we get in touch with ourselves? Do we develop this moral compass? And this is where pornography, when it comes to sex, is destroying that capacity. Absolutely. So, so I'm hearing more so than, than government, individual, parent, school institution, that it needs to be a community approach. Exactly. And that, I think that's a really uh, great point to leave the discussion on. And also because I'm looking at the Q&A list and it just keeps... Uh, getting added to and it's uh, flooding over two or three pages now so can, can I, I just get is... rid of you before you do I, I do want to make this point around um, pe um, the parental responsibility because it is a responsibility it is a daitva it is a responsibility it is a duty um, government as I said it's great if if they can regulate and, and, and do but I, frankly we can't wait for that and if it isn't pornography, it's the next thing. It's, as, as Gail said, it may be fast food, it may be the next thing and the next thing. It's important that parents take this responsibility. Now, they don't know how, they don't have the confidence, but in simple things like, um, for example, going when, when a kid is given a phone or, or a tablet and say, here's your phone, here's your tablet, is going through and saying, okay, we need to enable certain uh, filters on this, for example. Going through that with them and saying, okay, these are the filters, what do you think is appropriate and explaining going through with each one and saying this is saying that can these kind of sites be turned off what do you think now this is i'm not saying this is for 10 year olds this is for um, children who might be slightly older but going through that because you do have that responsibility when you give them a phone when you give them a, a, a tablet um that's just just one example but the, at the end of the day look <laughs> um it's up to us to at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the child. So it's for us to equip or parents to equip the child with the ability to make that decision. Because as I say, they have their peer groups, they have their friends, they're going to be exposed to all sorts of things, which is completely beyond our control. May I just add something to that? Because I think that's a great thing that you just said, is that on the Culture Reframed website, we have a social media contract, which the parent works through with the kid. And it's a contract that you jointly sign before the kid gets their um, tablet or phone. And you can even, if they've got the tablet and phone, you go back and you renegotiate the contract. Mm. But what happens is it explains all of this. It's like two, three pages, and it gives the parent the capacity to go through all these different things. And it's conversation-based, so you're not just imposing. So the kid begins to realise why you're doing this. And then what we say is, you know what? The kid will break the contract. That's in the job description of being a kid. Go back and redo it mm. again. So completely, we're on the same wavelength about exactly how we do this. And, exactly, and we've put this through a lot on culturally framed, how to help parents. That's really, really, really good to hear. And, and the fact there is, as I say, it's making it their decision because ultimately it's the, it's going to be their decision, but helping them helping them along that, that journey to, to making that decision. Thank you, Vidal. Sorry I, for... Uh, yeah, I'm sure we could go on uh, for much, much longer, but we're robbing, uh, robbing the audience of their, of their time to ask you uh, um, some questions, and I'm sure that will take us in some different directions. We've got one question here uh, from Dine uh, for Gail, 
If porn is so rife in Western society, would Dr. Dine say Western society is sex negative? Sex negative? I'd say most societies are sex negative. I wouldn't just say Western. There's very few societies that I'm aware of where which are, we can say have, I think, a positive view to sex. I mean, I'm open to discussion. It's not really my area, but I, I've not seen many places where I've gone where I felt this has a really healthy, and I do travel the world regularly giving lectures in not just the Western world, and I've not gone to places where I've found that this has an open, healthy approach to sexuality. Uh, interestingly, uh, interesting, because that um, leads me on nicely to a uh, question by Thedjil for Bhavinji. India is the third on the list of most Pornhub viewers. Is a Dharmic view effective? Why are we looking to Indian philosophy for advice regarding porn? Um, I think it would be a mistake uh, to correlate um, India's situation and consumption of porn with um, Dharmic principles. Um, as I said before, I, I reckon if you took that survey <laughs> a few thousand years back, I think the results would be very, very different. Um, unfortunately, it has become much more of a conservative culture when it comes to sex and sexuality in India. Unfortunately, attitudes have become, um, a, in some respects, more misogynistic. Unfortunately, it is still very much taboo. Um, I mean, on-screen kissing in Bollywood movies was only, only legalised a, a few years back, just to give some context. So it is no surprise then that there is, you know, and, and it goes back to your earlier point, there's no, there's no surprise then that you find um, this sort of repressed um, exposure to sex and sexuality to then immediately go to the extreme, which is by extra accessing uh, pornography. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a, a, uh, a, you know, a benchmark to follow by any means. But I think it, 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 anecdotally speaking, what it does, it, it shows that by repression and, um, and uh, making it a taboo, pornography is, is a perfect um, outcome of that in, 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 in a way, unintentionally, but that's what, what ends up happening. May I, may I add something as well? Um, sure, sure. We know that the industry targeted India specifically. One of the reasons they developed the cell phone is they wanted to get into countries that were overpopulated and couldn't, and you and the men couldn't have access to their own computer. So um, a friend of mine was at a workshop quite a few years ago before the cell phone came out in London, and it was a workshop run by the porn industry, and they spoke specifically about targeting India because it was so populate, overpopulated. So it's not by accident this has happened in India. And you talk about sex being taboo in India. There's a wonderful sex education group in India called Untaboo, which does great videos, which um, Culture Reframed is partnering with for a conference on sex education. But these are among some of the best short videos I've seen on how to do sex education. And it's called Untaboo, and it's, it's out of Mumbai, I think. All right. And, and if I, uh, seen as you cited statistics, also, there's a much larger young male population in India as well. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, just to add, if I can, it's fair to say that when you talk about nations with such large quantities and absolutes, everything is going to seem off the charts. We must talk relatively when we talk about, about nations. Um, Vishruti has asked uh, Bhavanji, are we saying there is no need for porn then? Um, and it is us humans that created the gap and the business? Um, I don't think there's, I mean, look, it, it may fulfill in, in, a need uh, in, in some respects, um, porn does. The, the issue is, is how you draw that line between what is harmless, what is a, for curiosity, what is for a bit of harmless entertainment to what becomes an addiction and overindulgence and, um, starts to detrimentally affect the psyche, the outlook, and how uh, relationships and intimacy is, is viewed. So it's very hard to make that, uh, um, draw the line between the two. And so I, if, if uh, pornography was simply just a, a bit of lighthearted uh, softcore entertainment that was used very sparingly, then maybe there isn't an issue with it. Um, 
but what it has become in terms of its accessibility, the nature of it, its extremity, how hardcore it's become, how it is in some ways deliberately targeting younger and younger people, that, that's an issue that, that um, it's difficult to just accept and, and ignore. Mm. Um, Sunil asks, sex in general is avoided in many cultures. A lot of young people, particularly boys and men, only, le only learn through this medium. How do we change that? Um, I'd like to go to Gail first. Well, good, robust sex education. That's from starting at the first at kindergarten. And you obviously you're not talking about how to have sex and stuff. You, you scaffold the whole idea. But um, there are ways in which you can start talking about bodily limits and, and bodily boundaries in very early on. Um, so the only way at this moment, I would say, to deal with it, as well as regulation, is to have an excellent sex education programme that teach, starts from the very beginning to help kids understand their sexuality and not just, and, it, and in England, I like the fact they called it sex and relationship education that they mandated, not just sex ed, because, you know, sex ed by in and of itself becomes how you put a condom on a banana. Talk about reducing it to its most basic, you know. So you really need to talk about love, empathy, connection, all of those things. And you can do that from a very early age. So uh, just a personal question then. Were you able to talk openly and honestly with your with your children about porn? Oh, and yeah. not asking about, about sex. Porn. We started with talking about bodily boundaries. We started from a very, for first of all, my, his first language was feminism. Right. They spoke feminism before you speak anything else. So that was very easy to do because we then scaffolded on that the idea that boys, you know, because I have a son, should have bodily boundaries that um, and we would talk about, you know, what does it mean to have a penis? How does that connect to your head and your heart? And these were early discussions. And then as we went on talk, I remember at around 11, I said to my son, you know what I said? You know, you're probably going to see porn. Maybe you'll look for it. Maybe your friends will look for it. I don't know. But And I can't be with you all the time. And you don't want me with you all the time. But he knew the work I did as well. We didn't keep a secret, but we're careful. And then I said, I just want you to think about something when you see it. Because you, you, you have a choice whether you look or not. Right? You don't have to look. And I want you to think about this before you make that choice whether you look. We don't know whether you're going to be gay, straight, by who knows what sexuality you're going to grow into. But you know what? It's going to reflect the wonderful adult that you are going to become. And it's going to be yours. And you're going to be the author of it. And you're going to own it. But if you look at porn, they're going to rob you of it. And that is a terrible thing to give away before you've even claimed ownership of it. And when he was at college and we were talking about porn, he said, well, mom, you pretty much threw in that one for me, which was, of course, it was exactly my role. Was to, yeah. So he could develop his own healthy sexuality and relationships mm. and intimacy. I didn't want the pornographers, those group of disgusting you know, predators in L.A. robbing him of what was rightfully his. And I don't want them robbing your kids either of what's rightfully there. Has, has he fed back now? Now he's a bit older. Has he fed back that that was something that? He, he agrees with that approach and... Oh, totally. I mean, he's, you know what? He sees things before I do. He points mm. things out about gender inequality before I do. I mean, it's in every bone of his body because this is what he brought up with. You said his first language was feminism. And I have to admit, sometimes when I hear the word feminism, I, I grit my teeth. And I, I have to ask, like, how does the feminism that you're talking about, which seems like something I'm very aligned with, differ from this very woke neoliberal feminism that we see today where it is all about empowerment it's right we believe and um, we're against any exploitation of women's bodies we do not believe it is empowerment we believe it is exploitation we believe that we need to have a society where women are no longer an oppressed sex class a society based on the equality of sex on every level i mean it's too much to go into if people are interested i do have a talk on youtube called Neoliberal Feminism and the Defanging of Radical Feminism, or something like Defanging Radical Feminism via Neoliberal Feminism. It's on YouTube. You can see it. It's got an hour and a half explanation of the feminism that I'm talking about versus this woke feminism, which I equally found distasteful. And actually, the so-called woke feminism, I think, is actually um, compliant with the patriarchy. It's the handmaiden of patriarchy. I totally disagree with this. The term sex work, 
as if being sexually exploited is a form of work and not exploitation, all of these things. But it's all in that. So you're asking me to condense into like two minutes what is really an hour and a half lecture. So I suggest people go and look that up. I'm sure, I'm sure they definitely will. Uh, another question here from a uh, brother. If porn uh, dismisses the beauty of sex, as you mentioned before, how can we bring that back and reduce the values that porn portrays according to you? Uh, and sorry, and the reduction of the values that porn portrays. So how do we bring the, the beauty back into uh, our conversations about sex, that, that intimacy, that vulnerability, that how, how can we bring that back in this culture that is, as you say, so pornified? Is, are you asking me or? Yes, Gail, sorry, yes, I am. How do we do that? Well, the first thing you do is you start looking at porn, right? Number one, get rid of porn. And it's exactly like saying to somebody, if you've been eating fast food all your life, how do you get back to the beauty of, of food, right? What do you do? You start experimenting, you start cooking, you start doing all those things. But, but the first thing you do is you stop eating fast food. So I think it's very similar in that you have to begin to really emb get embodied. That's number one, because if pornography teaches you anything, it's be disembodied. So you need to get more embodied. You need to start developing relationships with people you want to have sex with, whether you're L whatever, you're straight, gay, bi, whatever. And you need to start, you cannot, I think, have, a fundamentally trusting sexual relationship with somebody you don't know. And hook up culture, which is, you know, you hook up with someone you don't know them. How can you be vulnerable with somebody? My students would have sex with, um, on hook up, parties with hook ups. They didn't even know their names. And when I said, well, you didn't even take their names. They said, well, I didn't want to know their names. It's like, you can have sex with this person, but you don't even want to know their name. Okay, I mean, so we have to begin to rethink. And I think one of the things to do is, Again, stop porn and start having these conversations. There's enough stuff out there, feminist books, uh, TED Talks, etc., where you start having these learning pods and really discuss. You can't do it alone. And there's this excellent um, podcast called uh, Female Dating Strategies, which I recommend, which is a group of young women um, from the UK and the US and Canada talking about what it's like to live in a porn culture. And it's called, I think, fem Female Dating Strategies or Feminist Dating Strategies. It is fantastic podcast. So there are many resources out there that I would recommend. But the first thing you have to do is remove yourself from the porn culture, stop looking at it, and do not date men who use porn. I mean, well, first of all, that's ridiculous because you're not going to find a man who doesn't. What you have to say when you meet a man is one of the first things you have to find out is if they use porn. And if they do, then you tell them they have to stop. That that's, has to be an absolute beginning of a relationship. And if they won't, then you have to walk away. Women have to raise the bar on what they want from men. And um, would you give that same advice to men trying to date women that watch porn? Is it the same? Would... Of course I would. But you know what? It's not the problem there is that, you know, we know statistically women are much less likely to view porn. And the studies that have been done, and there's not enough of them, show that many of the women who go on the porn sites only go on not to masturbate, but to see what the guys want so they can give them porn sex. And then what some studies do show is that the women who do masturbate to the normal, to the mainstream hardcore porn sites have a history of child sexual abuse. So you're dealing with a much more complicated issue there as well. You've, you've conducted some interesting research with uh, former set, uh, child rapists. Could you share some insights from that as to what they said about the culture that we currently live in? Yeah, I think the best thing I was in, so I found myself in, interviewing in prison eight men, all of whom were in for downloading child pornography and then raping a child. Not one of them was a pedophile. That means that they prefer sex with adult women. Like pedophilia is a very specific diagnostic category. And I said to them, you pedophiles, and they were really upset with me. I said, of course we're not pedophiles. We prefer sex with adult women. So I said, then why did you go and look at child pornography and rape a child? And you know what they said? We were bored, wanted to try something different. That was it. And then one of them, particularly unsavory character, actually gave me the piece of the jigsaw puzzle that was missing when I was writing my book, Pornland. And at one point he was explaining to me how he groomed his 10 year old stepdaughter using porn um, to rape her. 
then went, then went on to rape her. And the grooming is what you do to get your victim ready for the abuse. And then he looked at me and he says something that forever changed the way I think. He looked at me and said, the culture did a lot of the grooming for me. And I, I, I almost fell off my chair because I thought, that's it. The culture has become a perpetrating groomer against our girls, doing the job of men like him, so that when he comes in for the kill or the rape, they've already been groomed by a porn culture to accept that they should be seen as disposable sex objects. So when you listen to these men talk, it is such an insight because they got he got it. And, you know, a pornographer, Joanna Angel, she was interviewed by Details magazine and she said something very interesting. She said the, the girls today, they come to the set porn ready. She's saying the same thing. The pornographer is saying the same thing as the child rapist because they work from the same playbook. The culture is grooming the girls to be, quote, porn ready, just as they're grooming them to be rape ready. It's, it's hard to be subjective when you're when you're listening to to information and statistics like this. But I wonder how do you feel listening to what what Gail was saying about these conversations with former child rapists? It's deeply worrying um, and concerning, not just as a as a member of society, but but also as a father. And it is, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, in many ways, shocking as well. But it, it, here's the thing: it's bleeding obvious. Um, we need to open our eyes and and, and, and look around us. Um, we're in denial if we think that is anything other than that. Um, but it's interesting the point that uh, Dr. Dines made around they were bored and looking for something exciting, these particular men who she, who she spoke with. I think many men would actually make that same comment. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier on, which is pornography isn't fulfilling the whole, it's creating that whole. Mm -hmm. So when they're looking for something more exciting uh, and go online and check pornography, it's now exposing them to things that they've never necessarily considered before um and uh so so it, it does um it does concern me it does worry me and i think it is it is a responsibility it is a duty for all of us as members of society um and of dharma as well because it, it just makes me think about dharma where where we look at the, the root of what is um what is pornography it is karma moha so desire and lust and Hindu thought particularly teaches us to control, moderate these in, in order to maintain dharma, but also because these are one of the, these are the most, uh, other than uh, uh, wealth, but, but moha and karma is the most, the strongest reason for bondage or vasana, which means birth and rebirth and suffering. So the karmic intensity um, binds us even more because of this. And the Puranas, the scriptures, and there's countless instances where great personalities were victims of lust and, and that was the cause of their downfall. So what, all in all, what is it teaching us? That we should control, we should moderate, we should discipline lust and, and, and passion, not, not deny it, not suppress it, but moderate it, regulate it, because absolutely no one is above it. This is the thing. No one is above it. We're all human. So it, it needs that personal regulation as well as societal. Um, and if society is, is as um, Dr. Dines is, is describing, then there's the, the onus is even more on, uh, upon us um, as responsible individuals to um, address it, uh, with, starting with ourselves, but also within our communities as well. And Bhavanji, it's interesting that you said that we are a victim of our own lust, because often, especially in the, the modern context and throughout this conversation, we've spoken about victims of, there are outside victims of our lust, right? Uh, I.e. Uh, the, the people who um, are like assaulted or abused because of uh, a lust that's within people, right? But what do you mean by becoming a vic being a victim of your own lust how does your lust affect you because it's insatiable because it is never ending because it can it, it isn't something that can be say okay i'm satisfied i'm done i won't ever need to um indulge in this ever again so the more the deeper you go the more binding it becomes um and that's a creation and cause for vast naive desire that makes you be it creates this karmic intensity um so 
and 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 there there is this been there's been this sort of fork in the school of thought when it comes to um, dharmic philosophy. One that says, you know, do it till you're blue in the face, embrace it and enjoy it, and do as much as you can, and you'll reach a point where you've you're saturated and you kind of think, been there, seen there, done it, bored of it, now I can move on. And there's the other school of thought which says actually that becomes the cause of your downfall. Very, very few actually reach the point where they're satisfied and they can move on. Most will become victims of it that they are, they are bound by. The lust has a grip over them. The moha has a grip over them. And so you become a slave to, to that, that lust and passion. Um, and so what Dharma teaches is, is to say, no, it, it has its use, it has its purpose, and therefore regulate it, have uh, engage in it with discipline. Um, and just going back to the topic of the conversation, what pornography comes and does, especially hardcore pornography and the accessibility of it, is completely disarms you. It, you, you just lose any ability and uh, to to discipline and 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 um, you know, control um, your senses, and so um, that's that's why you eventually become a victim in, in a sense. Well, also let's separate porn from sex. Porn is if there's a lust for anything, it's porn. It's a lust to debase, degrade, and dehumanize women. Where in porn, men make hate to women, not love. Right? There's mm. the it's the you don't see anything in porn that's close to what you would think of a lust for sexuality. It's a lust for absolute, the hatred of women and to see it. I mean, in pornography, the, the, the more hardcore it is, the more you destroy her body, the more popular it is. So it's, it's not, I think we have to separate sex from pornography, the, the desire for sexuality, for connection, and what porn is about. Porn is, you, weaponizes sex, but it's really about the destruction of women's bodies and everything else about them. I'm hearing uh, awareness, regulation, moderation, discipline, um, all fantastic buzzwords. Uh, we are, you know, I could go on for ages talking to you both. Uh, it's, it's been uh, a really riveting conversation. I've learned so much from you both, but we do uh, need to move on to closing remarks now. And as we've gone over slightly, I'm going to give you a little bit less time than I was initially allocating. So, uh, Gail, could you summarise in uh, two or three minutes? Your, your sort of final stance on this and, and maybe interweaving um, some of the comments that uh, Bhavanji has made throughout this discussion about, um, you know, pro-sex cultures in other parts of the world um, that you may may not have known about. Yeah, of, of course. I mean, I understand there's, a, you know, I wouldn't claim to know about every culture there is. I'm only talking about the ones that I've been familiar with and that. But I think what I'd like, first of all, I was very impressed listening to my um, colleague here and all of what you had to say. It was very interesting to hear all this. Um, I think what I would like to just close with is to say that we are just gonna have to adult up and do something about this. We cannot allow this to continue. If we care for our children, care for women, care for the society and care for men's well-being as well, then we have to act in ways that are gonna push us to our limits when it comes to bravery and courage. This is not an easy topic, as was discussed in the beginning. This is a topic where you will be slammed down, smacked down for sleep, speaking out about. You will be called sex ne negative. You'll be called a prude. All of these things. The re truth is we are on the right side of history here because we cannot live in a society like this. It simply cannot be sustained. And if we continue to do this, then we are not just going to have a climate collapse. We're going to have a cultural collapse. And we're seeing a lot of that happening right now. So the end I would say is be as bold and as courageous as you can be. Do not be afraid. And there's a wonderful saying I want to say to every, the women out there, um, and I'm gonna mess up the saying, so please excuse me, but something like well-behaved women rarely make history. We have been way too well behaved here. It is time for us to fight back and do what has to be done to basically make this an egalitarian society, to stop women being an oppressed sex class, to make this no longer be a patriarchal culture. So I would invite all women to misbehave along with me. And thank you for inviting me to this wonderful discussion. Thank you, Gail. Uh, over to you, Bhavanji, for your final closing remarks. Um, I would say... In, in the Dharmic tradition, in the Vedic tradition, 
we always look at the other with a certain respect. When I say namaste, I'm, I'm, the divinity within me is, is respecting and bowing down to the divinity within you. So each life, each being is, is divine. And what we are discovering is although we, and when I say we, men may see uh, view pornography as just some lighthearted, harmless entertainment, what has come to light as part of this discussion as well is, in fact, there are other subtleties to do with the pornographic industry. Um, so, for example, the pornography is an industry that is in many ways complicit to the horrendous evil of human trafficking. And consumption of pornography, therefore, contributes to the very dark side of that industry. There's no doubt in my mind that that is a dharma. So while we could take the very realistic and pragmatic view that, look, pornography is all part of parcel of life, as long as there isn't addiction, overindulgence or obsession, we shouldn't worry too much about it. You know, it's just young men discovering their way or, or through curiosity and uh, going through life. But if we take the dharmic point of view and we look at the detriment to the individual's psychology, the way it governs their relationships and intimacy, their expectations from their partners. If we look at um, the effect it's having on broader society in terms of over-sexualization um, and all the other reasons we, we've discussed this evening, um, it is my belief from the dharmic point of view that um, as well as all the harmful, harmful effects we, we've discussed, that um, dharma does not accept pornography. Um, and I think it's important that rather than just abstaining, that we also raise that awareness and education, beginning with you know, our own families and, and, and communities. But the most important thing I think that I take from this conversation is we've got to talk about it because right now, believe me, nobody is. And, and well done for Vichar Manthan and the team for, for you know, providing this platform and uh, um, addressing this topic. It's very brave. Thank you so, so much for sharing your insights and thoughts at, at this month then. Uh, Dr. Dines, your experience over the last 30 years speaks volumes and, and we're very honoured uh, to have you here on the platform and share your ideas with us. And equally, Bhavanji, uh, the nuanced perspective that you were able to provide uh, has been a really, it made a really insightful dialogue uh, of the last sort of hour and a half. So uh, I'd like to just highlight some of my main takeaways from, from this discussion. Conversations need to be had. We can't just sit in silence while this private epidemic takes place in everyone's bedrooms around the country, around the world. And all of those who have a, a vested interest in uh, the well-being of the next generation need uh, need to get behind this public health approach that uh, Gail has spoken about uh, to, to combat the misinformation, misconceptions, misunderstandings around the effects of porn, because they are detrimental after all. Um, we must also take responsibility. It's not just up to governments, uh, school institutions, families, um, but there needs to be a uh, an individual and also a, a community approach. And I hope that this discussion has served as holding a mirror up to ourselves. I suppose the Dharmic perspective would highlight more and more that when we recognize ill in, in something else that actually is a reflection of, um, of, of ourselves too. So how can we take personal responsibility for the way that this uh, porn industry has uh, expanded uh, and affected our communities and wider societies? Uh, as I said at the beginning, we at Vajara Month are not here to provide absolute answers. We're keen to open the discussion and we encourage you to take it into your own homes and forums and, and discuss openly with your own families and peers and friends. Uh, join us on social media at Vajara Month and to continue dialoguing with us and to keep the conversation going. Um, and aside from joining our live discussions, there are a number of ways that you can take part in Vajara Month. And firstly, there's our VM podcast series. It's perfect for a long walk or a commute, and it's available across all major audio streaming platforms at, or at vicharamanthan.org forward slash podcast. And we actually have episode six dropping tomorrow on the Hindu library. We also have our 
fantastic the Trimontham book clubs, which provide another great space to earnestly explore and discuss ideas. It happen, they happen all across the country every week. And for details on how to attend the nearest book club to you, visit vicharamanthan.org forward slash book club. I would like to personally take this opportunity to thank our well wishers, without whom our work would not be possible. If anyone watching would also like to support our efforts in this way, please use the QR code displayed on the screen or use the link provided in the comment section below. And before you leave today, you can subscribe to our channel. Um, you'll be notified when each new discussion uh, is released on YouTube. To hear more about our events uh, in advance, be sure to sign up to our mailing list at vicharamanthan.org forward slash mailing list. Uh, and I promise we won't spam you. <laughs> And finally, please diarise at 7 p.m. on Saturday, the 7th of August for our next month on beauty. I've been Vidhu Sharma. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Good evening and namaste.